So welcome everyone to our session. Today we're going to be talking about something that's actually been uh, popular with teachers, especially during virtual instruction. But it's not to say it's not something that we weren't already seeing being used during face-to-face -face instruction, and that is crafting your playlist. So I'm Carolina Lopez, and I'm here today with Mrs. Julie Kelly. Hi, everybody. Glad you're here. Hi. So, so we, we have some course objectives that we're going to be going over today. We have, of course, language objectives and a content objective. We know that this is something that we do for English learners. So we're just modeling what is happening in classrooms already. So our content objective is quite simple. And that is we're going to learn how to craft a playlist that meets the needs of all learners. And, the key word in this uh, content objective is really the, the idea of crafting. What does it mean to craft a playlist? And throughout this session, you will be using your language domains. You will be listening. We'll have an opportunity to discuss. We'll also, you know, you're welcome to take some notes, uh, type in the chat, and, you know, of course, reading information that is presented on the screen. So with that said, well, move along. So the first question is, if you'll please um, unmute yourselves, what do you think is a playlist? What's a playlist? Uh, things put together uh, that we're going to use. Um, it doesn't have to be just one format. It could be different or maybe different things in different of uh, different items in one program okay when i think of a playlist i think of um like the music that i listen to when i exercise uh yes. So yes. <laughs> i put a group of group of songs together and that's what i listen to so for my classroom i i would think it's um uh just like in google classroom that we we save information for our children uh, under the different concepts that we teach. Um, so I'm thinking it's like that you always, um, something that you say for them so that you can retrieve as you need for a, a different a different concept. I think that's where I first learned the word playlist too, is thinking of music. Any other thoughts on what is a playlist? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Ready, Catalina? Yes. So we know that we said that a playlist is, uh, you know, we're thinking about music, right? We also said that a playlist is um, something that is, you know a list of an, a list of things to do and we also said that a playlist is i think i missed one of them i think that was something else do you guys putting want to help me out? together putting things together and that's pretty much sums up what we think a playlist is. But Mrs. Kelly is going to draw your attention to what we see on the uh, right hand side of the screen. Okay, so this is more of a contextual also response. So um, with a playlist, when we ask students to complete multifaceted independent activities, so I'm hearing a little bit of connection to what some of you mentioned. A playlist serves as guidance and sequencing without real-time teacher actions. With playlists, the responsibility for executing the learning plan shifts. Because the teacher has already set up the plan, students are given the unit, the lesson, the activity, etc., the plan, including access to all the lessons ahead of time. With the learning plan in hand, students work through the lessons and assignments at their own pace. 
personalized, teachers implement playlists in conjunction with personalized learning strategies to target specific student interest skills and needs. And that's a little bit of what we're getting into is that crafting is that third paragraph there. So, um, is that you or me, Carolina? That, that is me. So now that, you know, Mrs. Kelly has kind of just painted a, a picture, provided some context related to what a playlist um, involves, what are some key words that really just kind of pop out, stand out for you? And when we talk about what a playlist is, we, we mean in terms of using it online or using it offline, uh, both, both modalities. What are some key words that pop out? Items. Okay. What Works else? At your own pace. Uh -huh. Awesome. Working at your own pace and knowing that we have different types of students in our class, that's, that's very important that our students know that there is an opportunity for them to, you know, work quicker if they need to, or, you know, take it a little bit slower if they need some more processing time. Anything else that pops out? Interest. Interest. So the key to getting students to do anything is just really making sure that it's interested. Interesting, I'm sorry. And it's not just students, but adults as well. We need to be, really interested in something to want to do it. So uh, it should be something that is um, keeping their interests in mind. These are all good key words that uh, the group has come up with. Is there something else that maybe we've overlooked? Um, Mrs. Kelly? Uh, Mrs. Rachel, go ahead. Oh, um, it's access to the lessons ahead of time. Yeah. And that's important, right? I remember myself as a student, I was a very nervous child and I can still kind of be, you know, get angsty, but I, I appreciated knowing what was going to happen the next day. And I clearly remember my, my fifth grade teacher knowing that for me, math was, you know, I don't know how I passed college algebra, but, you know, she knew that it made, it, it was a time during the instructional day that made me very tense. And so before the end of the day, she let me know, you know, tomorrow we're going to go over place value. We're going to look at place value with decimals. So, you know, having a playlist for a child who may be experiencing some anxiety, especially right now with the pandemic. I just read an article about how this is a very real issue, not only for adults, but also for teens and children. Then this, you know, may help. Um, students who are going through this just to know, okay, this is what's coming down the pipeline. This is what's going to be expected of me. Anything else before we move on? Yes, Mrs. Kelly? Yeah, I want to add, I think it's important that we keep in mind that the activity should also be multifaceted so that we hit the different um, domains of listening, speaking, reading, writing, online, offline, um, completing a project, reading a task, collaborating, independent, where I, it just, it needs to be very multifaceted if we're gonna keep our kids engaged. And that also just shows that as a teacher, we're respectful of their learning styles, right? So we're providing a different, uh, if, if it's multifaceted and allowing them to interact and respond in different ways, then we are also showing that we're honoring, you know, the type of learner that they are. So definitely a key point. Okay, so moving along, um, I went and looked for a playlist that was available online. So this has not been created by anybody in our district. So I'm not singling anybody out, but, and it's also timely because, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. So when you look at this playlist and based on the keywords we just talked about and the words that you also brainstormed were also val valid uh, playlist descriptors, um, what do you see 
as strengths in this playlist? What does this playlist have as value? Estella or? The steps. Okay. So you can see that there's a sequence. Go ahead. The image, the picture with the, the heart. Uh, okay. It's real world. It, it It's applicable to the real world. This is something that they can apply to their real world experience. Correct. And you know what? We did not put real world as a, um, a key word. And I, I think that's a good point. We always need to be making the connections of, of the value. And so um, we should probably add that as well. When you look at this, um, what's missing from this playlist based on our keywords? Let's see. I'm looking at, is there any opportunity for students to have pace, work at their different paces? It's not specifically written in, but it could be. Like we're starting this task on Monday, please have it done by Tuesday or have it done by Thursday. Um, you know, work on it when you can. So there's there's opportunities to add explicit directions regarding pace. Um, definitely get student interest, I think. Do you think it's multifaceted? Think of the number of language domains that students will need to use to complete this playlist. Is yeah. there an opportunity to add other language domains? Another question to ask um, besides the language domains is, is there an opportunity for your advanced learner to do something more complex is or is there encouragement for them to do so and perhaps your student who needs much more support academically are there supports in there um, to meet their needs of differentiated learning objectives on their letter writing so those are just we're just starting to introduce the concept of crafting Um, also, Ms. Kelly, on um, maybe also a recording from the teacher as far as the instructions so that the children can listen for you, for those those students who are, you know, who are, listen, are more into a listening and maybe the ones who can't read yet, they'll be able to just hear the instruction and know what they can do. Correct. Um, I agree totally. I love that idea. We have Paula here who's got, Paula, I don't remember, are you pre-KK? They probably need the auditory directions. Right, we're using the Seesaw program and that allows the students, it has an area in the Seesaw program where they're allowed to click on a microphone and they're able to record their answers if they don't have anyone who's able to type it for them. Yeah, yeah. it's a great program. Um, and then we have Tom, you know, here who's with middle school representing, he may have a huge gap in a classroom where there's some kids who need the auditory because their reading isn't where the other sixth graders or seventh graders are. So there's multiple ways to craft to bring in all of our different kiddos. Good conversation. I'm excited that we're doing this because we're already just kind of naturally starting the crafting process, even though we haven't really gotten to defining and talking about crafting, but you're already putting on that lens of how can this playlist meet the needs of all of our students and looking at it 
from the lens of an English learner in particular. We talk about um, differentiating for the English learner, but what we often don't talk about is how that even that differentiation for the English learner really does need to be by proficiency level. So because I have five English learners in my class, does it necessarily mean that they all need the same type of differentiation? What I'm going to do for my beginner in listening may look very different than what I'm going to do for my advanced student in listening. So just as a reminder, any chance, any opportunity for you to include all of the language domains, as many of them as possible in a playlist, the more the better. Anytime students can practice this skill by listening, speaking, reading, or writing, that's going to help. Of course, every playlist serves a different purpose. And so you may not, um, you know, it may just be that one playlist where, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get the speaking in there. I'm not saying that every single playlist needs to have all four, but if you can include the four, that's great. And so what you're seeing in front of you are TEA definitions of what these language domains are. So if you notice in listening, it says the ability to understand spoken language, comprehend and extract information and follow social and instructional discourse through which information is provided. So when I talk about differentiating by proficiency level, your beginner is probably gonna need you to work as far back as the social discourse because they may not understand even the directions that you're giving them and they may need um, some differentiation through gestures. But your advanced students, they're struggling with uh, under uh, listening and understanding perhaps lectures or conversations about academic topics. So notice that it's the social and instructional discourse, the two types of language repertoires. And for speaking, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna see the same thing. It's the ability to use spoken language appropriately and effectively in learning activities and social interactions. And this particular sample that Julie has for us, it's a love letter to yourself. So you may see some of that um, social interaction that students can engage in speaking to, if it comes to maybe sharing their letter with someone else or, or sharing why they wrote what they wrote in the letter. Reading, the ability to comprehend and interpret written text at the grade appropriate level. And the key here is at the grade appropriate level. So just because there are English learners, we're not going to lessen the rigor and we're not going to water it down. It must be at the grade level. And when we're looking at TELPAS and the language domains and we're rating, it's how is this student performing within that grade level. For writing, it's the ability to produce written text with content and format to fulfill grade appropriate classroom assignments. What I like about this playlist sample that was selected for us to look at, it's, it's a letter. So we know that there's different modes of writing. And so we're going to, you know, we're assessing here and seeing, does a student know maybe, you know, the different components of a letter? The letter has, you know, an opening and a closing. It's got, you know, um, the date somewhere at the top. And so this, these are the kind of things that, that can also be assessed and become a part of the format. Does a student know how to use written language in formal and informal situations? So those are the TEA definitions of what the language domains are. But if we move on to the next slide that really just highlights these global definitions of what it means to be a beginner, what it means to be at the intermediate level, what it means to be at the advanced and the advanced high level. And so I really, you know, we can we can spend time reading these definitions, but the key features are listed on the right hand side for us, where we know beginning is the key words. It's little to no English ability. So it may be little to no English ability to understand 
spoken language, you know, for listening. For intermediate, it's limited ability, simple language structures, high frequency vocabulary, routine context. So this means for listening, reading and writing, it's limited. Everything is simplistic, the, the simple format. I, I um, kind of equate this to like the minimum, like just enough to survive, uh, perhaps start to defend yourself, but not really thrive within that academic um, grade level with the content. Advanced, here you are. Notice it's the first time where we see the ability to engage in grade appropriate academic instruction. We don't see that at the intermediate level as much because remember, it's very simplistic at that level. But once that they're, they're at the advanced, this is where, okay, now there can be a little bit more interaction in terms of the academic. And that's why we see a lot of the struggle with the intermediate where our students, they, you know, when they get stuck, right that we call it to get stuck in the intermediate level and then of course the advanced time which again is also the ability to engage in great appropriate academic instruction but it is with minimal second language acquisition support so it's okay not everything is going to be perfect they're not going to understand 100 percent of everything that you send there may be some things here and there they don't understand whether it's listening or or even there may be some things here and there that they they don't know how to verbalize and how to how to say orally or even when they're reading or writing and that's all right but with um very minimal support the student is able to have that interaction. We're noticing the advance, it's just with the support. So they're gonna be able to do it, but I need to support them. So a lot of our students tend to fall either in the intermediate or the advanced um, level of TELPA. So when you look at a playlist, look at, okay, what can I do? What, How can I improve? What can I add potentially to this playlist that is gonna be a benefit to my beginner, be, be a benefit to my intermediate, to advanced and advanced high, and always include that, like Ms. Mrs. Kelly said, what can I do to, to maybe um, increase the rigor? Because the, ca the catch is that if they're in a, an intermediate level, we wanna add something that's perhaps at the tail end of intermediate or beginnings of advanced so that we can move the student along um, the language acquisition continuum. I need to turn my mic on. All right, so Catalina, um, I think this was gonna be you. Yes, yeah, so we have this playlist again, right, in front of us. And now that I've shared, you know, the integrating of the language domains and the proficiency levels, I want you to think of it in terms of an English learner. And what is it, what strategies are present to meet the needs of EL? So what is already there? that we could say, you know what, this meets the needs of English learners. Raquel? Uh, a visual. The visual, great. What else? Anytime you can use visuals with ELs, that's a plus. Uh, what about the video? Could that okay. be one? The video, right? So, you know, the graphics, whatever they see in the video, that's gonna help. Are they using at least one language domain here? I mean, there's, we see the writing, right? Okay, so we know that there's already, there's already stuff here. And so and this isn't, you know, this, this playlist doesn't get an F, so to speak, but, but there is room for improvement, right? There is a need for crafting. So now we're gonna move on to the phase of how exactly do we craft? What does it mean? So um, great conversations on playlists and ELs. Yeah, let's definitely, let's talk about what does crafting mean? And um, if you'll think back to our summer professional development, if you remember those three courses everybody had to take, the third level was crafting. And, and so it's a reference back to that where now let's use it at a, let's kick it up to the third notch of usage. Let's kick it up. And so for crafting, it's personalized learning. So you're meeting the needs of your kiddos. 
uh, implemented with high fidelity and success. So it does. It, it means on a frequent basis, you are meeting the needs of the kids of your ELs by adding these domain practices into your playlist. You're not doing it once a month. That's not fidelity. High fidelity means it is who you are as a teacher. Um, and then success means the students are reacting positively and successfully to your playlist. What you are trying to teach, they are demonstrating as learning. So that's the stage where we'd like to, you know, help um, everybody with crafting. High fidelity, happening frequently, and with uh, student success, of course, in learning. And so I've got to see what was. Okay, so um, open ended. Now that we've talked, how can we, what can we do to this playlist for student success for all our students? We have one video. Watch this video. What could be an alternative? that we could put in there. I mean, a kiddo up here or a kiddo down here or a kiddo who needs language support. Maybe I mean, more than one choice of a video. Mm -hmm. Right, there's some videos out there, you know, they use big words and that's perfect for some kiddos, but other kiddos need a slower video or more simplistic vocabulary, perhaps. So um, even the learning objective of what uh, what you want included in your letter, choice of uh, requirements for your different kiddos. Thank you, Paula. Any other thoughts? I was also looking at the letter and how it has, you know, the labeling to kind of show that it, that the, you know, the parts of the letter where it has the date and it has the opening and things of that nature, maybe more than one example of a letter, maybe different levels where, you know, something like this letter, you know, is a longer letter, but maybe something that would be shorter that would meet that, you know, that, that might not be as overwhelming for someone who is a beginner. I like it. And sometimes seeing the examples of a shorter one will help some of your kids plug in. And then that, the longer, that is, go ahead. I'm sorry, that is definitely true for your English learners because a lot of times they feel they cannot compete with other students. So to show them, you know what, like, like Paula just mentioned, a shorter one is really gonna help what we call that affective filter or this just invisible shield that they have, which will lower it into where they're more receptive and will participate in class. So I, I like that you're thinking about that because, and that you suggested that because in the EL world, we talk about three different domains. We talk about their linguistic domain, their cognitive domain, but we also talk about the affective domain. And if the affective domain is not being um, considered when we're creating these playlists, then it doesn't matter how great the playlist is, we're not going to reach our students, at least not all of our students. And chances are the ones who need the most help. Yeah, if we go back to our definition of crafting, you'll have high fidelity because you are doing a great job of doing it frequently, but the kids aren't successful. So it's got to be both parts. It's got to be the teaching and the learning. Um, on your slide where you have the, the website for that video, um, you can also put the image and then just link that website to the image so that the students can, can see the different choices, see an image to the choice um, instead of seeing um, just the website. I agree. I, I don't like that. Watch this video. It just doesn't pull me in. And I think the image and the choice of the 
I, I, to I totally agree with you. It's that, that imagery pulls us in. And I don't even like the words, watch this video. I just, it just seems really, ugh. So word choice too, I guess, right? As we give directions. As a former middle school teacher, I think of students that have the uh, oppositional deficit, or I'm not sure what the term is, but where they're very, they, you know, in Spanish we call them contrechas. They're always giving you contra. They're always telling you, no, I'm not going to do that. So I could see where the student is like, why do I have to watch this video, especially the older students? Why this <laughs> one? Why not the one I want to see? Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Moving along. Um, and then just a, another way of looking at um, crafting with high fidelity. Earlier, one of the keywords we pulled out was pace. Um, you know, so pace is students self-direct their learning and pace through content and learning experiences. So the student will be able to work at different paces. And then path means teacher adjusts the content. We just mentioned that, how they could do this video or that video. So that's PATH, teacher adjusts content and assigns students to use specific tools or lessons based on student need. The use of content has become an integral part of instruction. That's the video choices, this video or this video, that's that content choice. But to boost student growth through a variety of methods or resources to achieve a learning goal. So all these wonderful conversations we just had, that's what we're talking about is crafting at high fidelity. And so I, I encourage and hope you all embrace these thoughts and ideas um, at your, and it's going to look different whether you're teaching pre-K or fifth grade, but um, I hope you embrace some of these uh, conversations. Something that I wanted to add um, based on what was just on the other slide is the idea of based on student need. That phrase there, that's personalized instruction. So a lot of times when we hear these terms, what are you doing to personalize instruction for your students? What are you doing to meet their needs? Well, through the act of crafting and through providing these you know, adjustments, how, it doesn't matter how minimal they are, this, that's part of providing that personalized instruction. So what we've provided for you here is just a, just a list of different resources that you can use during remote instruction. This is what we're hearing from teachers about in terms of, I just, I need to know what else to use. Today, I heard one teacher tell me that he learned early on that he needed to mix it up. That if he didn't change what he was using, um, on a daily or weekly basis, you know, his students tuned out. So we just want to remind you that there are probably um, platforms that you've already used and that you are familiar with. And, and if not, we've, we've included a link here. And, you know, that's what we're here for. We're here to help you um, learn how, how to use these and provide them, especially for our English learners. But the first one there is um, the use of, of Google Docs. I know that TEA has already said that the, the platform that they're going to be using for speech to text really is what's used in Google Docs. So if we're already engaging our students in lessons that require the use of this, then they've gotten that practice already. It helps students see what they are saying. And it's um, just something that I think really meets the needs of especially your beginners uh, when terms of the language proficiency levels. And also, you know, we have some early childhood teachers here. Imagine students just being able to to speak and then see their oral language convert into to written text. And so they are now authors, you know, of, of this um, of this uh, piece that, that is now, you know, in front of their screen. And then, of course, Vocaroo. I didn't know about it, but a quick Google search, I learned how to use it. It is a free open education resource. It's really simple to use. If I can use it, I guarantee that you can use it. You don't really need any formal training for this, 
but it's a great tool for students to record short responses. So again, we've included the link there. We encourage you to click on it and just kind of play with it and see how you can use it with your students. So, you know, maybe one day or one week, you're gonna use Vocaroo. And once your students, your children are good and, and they're used to this, then, you know, you're gonna switch it up to Flipgrid just to kind of, you know, um, keep keep that interest going and, and keep them wanting to know what what is, what is on the learning menu for the day. And then of course, Flipgrid, it's a recording platform that allows students to collaborate in, in a discussion. And what's great about this one and why it's become very popular is because it does sync with Google Classroom. Just yesterday, I heard of an English learner uh, who was in first grade who really doesn't speak in class, is very shy to, to speak in class and unmute themselves but they're producing awesome flip grids and practicing their oral, their oral language skills. So the, the fact that in a playlist we could craft uh, and, and insert an opportunity for a student to provide a recorded response um, through any of these two platforms that I mentioned is, is awesome. And then of course Jamboard, again, it's just something you have to play with. You have to experience. I just kept hearing teachers talk about Jamboard and I'm like, okay, what is this? And it's just a space. Just consider it as a space for ELs to engage in a written dialogue with peers. It works like a Google Doc and we've included a link of an example for you to just kind of preview. I, it reminds me a little bit of a um, a Padlet and that you can, you know, you can put a sticky note on there, you can change the background, but it's just, it just provides that space. So these are some of the resources there and they don't really require formal teaching. It's just click on the link and play with it and see, see, see what you can do. But other resources, and this is one that Julie Kelly reminded me about, and I've been um, sharing this as much as possible with teachers, is Padlet. We've had Padlet for a while, and we've used this in professional learning, but we often forget that, you know, we can actually upload a recording in Padlet. So, you know, when you click on those three little dots and you decide, you know, to insert an image, or you're going to type a response, there's an opportunity for you to also add, you know, an audio response. So again, providing the same kind of opportunity as in with Flipgrid or with a uh, vocal group. So if you want students to respond to something that they've read and that's part of their playlist, you know, your beginner may respond orally but your advanced or your advanced high student they may respond uh you know writing and just knowing that students have uh this option is gonna you know motivate them to participate and then of course nearpod i don't have a lot of experience with nearpod but i have played with it and um with nearpod i know they have an interactive feature which is called collaborate and it's a tool that can be used to brainstorm where students can see their responses of text and images in real time. So this is also something to consider. One of the things that a teacher shared with me today when we talked about the use of breakouts and, and I was trying to figure out, you know, how do you go about going into all of these breakout rooms? And so he told me, he's like, sometimes when I use Nearpod, like I just have to have this screen open and I can see all of their responses in real time. And so I'm not necessarily going into each room to see that the student is doing it. I have the evidence there in front of me because that can be overwhelming as well. So, you know, you could do that with Nearpod. Of course, that's also an option with interactive slides or even, um, you know, the Google Doc. And then, of course, let's not forget the platforms that we have. We know that um, we use Google Classroom and Seesaw and Pre-K. They're the learning management systems that we have in our district. And they're a great way for us to um, uh, connect with students through discussion forum, you know, uh, type in a comment, uh, you know, maybe it's just going to be a, a post about what we read. So there's also an opportunity to do that within the learning management system, which is a start. And we still haven't used any of these other resources, which is not an exhaustive list, but that we've mentioned um, here for you. 
Thank you. Um, Paula mentioned Seesaw in, in the recording. It's Is anybody else um, use Seesaw or is it just Paula? It's wonderful, isn't it? It's so good. I'm, I'm glad we we took that dive. Ms. For, for our digital notebook, um, under my, my all about me, uh, myself, um, there is an activity in Seesaw where the kids get to just talk about themselves. And, and of course, Paula and I, we teach pre-K and uh, the kids just love talking about themselves, about their favorite color, their favorite food, everything about them. And, and then they get to record it. It's just amazing. That old fashioned show and tell. <laughs> yes. So um, in Google, I wanna talk a little bit about Google Classroom. Um, as we craft, sometimes you're gonna, um, create playlists that are for different groups of students. So uh, you create a playlist, you know, that's for the majority of your students, make a copy of it, and then alter it a little bit um, with the material that matches other kids' learners, uh, other learner needs. But then in Google Classroom, you can assign your different playlists to specific students. And so sometimes you can craft and have all those choices on the same playlist. Another option is to create multiple copies of the playlist and then assign it to specific students so that they don't see what the others are getting. So it just depends what you're doing, whether you're gonna put all the choice of path and pace on one playlist, or if you're gonna make a copy of it and you know craft it individually. So there's the uh, assigned to specific students. Another thing you can do is if you're going to do the same playlist, Google Classroom has the option to assign due dates. So you might assign most of your students to finish something by Wednesday. So you're going to send it to those kiddos. And then you're going to change the due date to Wednesday. And then send it again to the other group of students. But then maybe they have a Thursday or a Friday due date. That's another way of crafting um, meeting the kids' needs. Um, Google Classroom, we, because we have the enterprise version of uh, Google, Google now has, we now have the action in Google Classroom to create rubrics. And you can create rubrics, you know, for different levels of kiddos and then assign the task to the students where they each get the rubric that meets their learner needs. Everybody's doing a letter but maybe the learning objective is a little different for everybody. So create a rubric that matches so that they have that opportunity to be successful. And then, of course, sometimes crafting is um, asking, is not telling the kids necessarily what tool to use. Crafting is also um, letting the kids pick the tool. And you can do that in Google Classroom. When the kids in their button, they have the option to uh, use doc slide sheets for drawings. And sometimes that's liberating and crafting as well, depending on what the playlist is, where the playlist is going. So we're kind of at the end of our of what we wanted to talk about with crafting your playlist. Uh, we'd like to share this um, quote from George Wood. Um, it looks like Catalina's got some company. Uh, the, personalized, the personalization of learning is not just pretending kids have choices in what they're going to learn. Rather, it is building environments in which teachers have the time and skill to know their students. That's that personalization. Um, know their students and can adjust the pace the materials and their surroundings so they can meet the needs of all learners. And that's what crafting a playlist is all about. Catalina? Yes, thank you, Julie. I, we, we were looking for the right quote and, um, you know, sometimes it takes a while to find them. And when we were looking for this one, I said, do you think it's too long? And Julie's like, no, Catalina, this is the perfect one. This is really what really what crafting is all about. So um, we wanna thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. We know you're probably Zoomified 
and really tired at this point, but we do have a survey that we'd like for you to take. I think, uh, Julie, did you place um, the link to this? Okay, she'll be putting that in the chat and that way you can take the brief survey because really your feedback drives future professional learning. So if there is something that you would like us to do, please be specific and explicit and just say, you know, hey, can can we please have a session on, you know, this? I really want help with this. So it's really quick. I promise you it will not take you long. I think there's only two questions, right, Julie, on the, the survey? And so um, we just want to, three? Three questions, okay. We just want to make sure that we really, um, we hear from you and that that way we we know what to present. We do want to try and offer these twice a week. So um, bi-weekly and uh, we, we thank you for your service. We thank you for everything that you do. We know that teaching is already difficult and it's just magnified now with COVID and um, we, it doesn't go unnoticed. And I am really just, what you're doing today by being present is really admirable because you don't have to be here. This is your own time, but it shows how much you really care. And so on behalf of you know our department and Julie's department who really just services the entire district, our, our district services, you know, 4,334 English learners, we thank you. Um, for that and so um, we will stay online for a couple of minutes in case there's any final thoughts or questions comments that anybody would like to um, share I am going to stop the recording at this time <laughs>